this is lecture 23 of CS229. Um, so uh, today we are going to just continue the, the uh, finals review that we started last class and uh, we will finish up the final review and uh, that is going to be it. So uh, we, we might finish a little early today. All right, um, continuing the, the, um, the uh, final reviews. So in the last class we started off with supervised learning. We, we, um, um, we kind of again went through linear regression, all the different interpretations of linear regression um, such as uh, minimizing the square loss, the probabilistic interpretation, the projection interpretation, the normal equations. Um, and then we moved on to logistic regression uh, which is um, a model that you can use for classification logistic regression outputs a probability uh, for each uh, for each example of uh, the probability that the the, uh, uh, the class is equal to 1 and then you can use a threshold and convert it into a classifier and then we uh, spoke about newton's method uh, which is another optimization problem that works well for convex or concave problems and uh, the the key summary from newton's method is that it can be very efficient uh, in terms of converging quickly but Newton's method is kind of plug and play which means it automatically performs optimization. You don't need to specify whether you want to maximize a function or minimize a function. You just throw a function at it and it optimizes uh, by finding the nearest stationary point which means if your function is concave, convex then it automatically minimizes it for you. If it is concave it automatically maximizes it for you. If it is neither convex or concave, it just takes you to the nearest, um, uh, nearest uh, stationary point. All right? That was Newton's method. Moving on, so uh, there was this other algorithm that we saw called the perceptron algorithm. Right? So the uh, perceptron algorithm was a streaming algorithm. By streaming we mean it is an algorithm where you encounter one example at a time. You know, think of it like stochastic gradient descent where you are encountering one example at a time. Right? And the perceptron algorithm had a very simple update rule which was uh, theta equals theta plus alpha times y minus g of theta transpose x, right? where g was just an indicator function which would return 1 if theta transpose x is greater than or equal to 0 or it would return 0 if theta transpose x was less than 0. So this is the indicator function which returns 1 if z is greater than equal to 0, returns 0 if z is less than 0. Right? Um, and the, the uh, idea here was that supposing um, you have some examples, let us uh, let's use some colors. So, let us say you have some positive examples right? and you have some negative examples right? and uh, uh, for our purposes suppose this is the origin and you have a theta vector that is currently pointing in some direction. Right? Generally you want theta, the theta vector to point in the direction of your, of your uh, positive class. So, the, the intuition behind the way um, um, the perceptron algorithm works is that if your answer is correct, that is if theta transpose x is greater than or equal to 0, then this whole term evaluates to 0 if you make a correct prediction. Right? And so you, you, you do not change, um, you change your parameters at all. However, if you make a mistake, that is if the correct answer was 1 and you predicted a 0, that means that um, you want to, uh, this will then end up, uh, I forgot x here, right? This will then end up adding a small, uh, a small scalar times x to your parameter vector, right? Which means if this is uh, where a theta is pointing and the new example uh, x is, let us say, over here, um, over, over here, then the decision boundary of the uh, uh, current parameter vector would be something like this and let us say the, uh, uh, make it easier, let us say uh, the, the uh, uh, example was here and so the, the, uh, the decision boundary is like this and so um, 
this this uh, example is now predicted as a negative because it is it is on the other side of the uh, decision boundary so what we want to do is now is to take this x vector okay? this is the uh, x vector which got misclassified right take a small for, uh, a small scalar times this um, um, x vector and add it to theta vector so which means you add a small component right so the we we'll call this alpha times x and now this becomes the updated parameter vector right and in this updated parameter vector for for this the separating uh, hyperplane which is perpendicular to it so this would be the updated separating hyperplane and now we see that the uh, x is now correctly classified right so the the general idea here the the, the larger take home message is that when you want some vector theta vector to take a value that's that's closer or uh, is oriented closer to some desired vector then a thing you can do or an obvious thing you can do is to add a small scalar times the vector to the desired vector right that is theta plus alpha times x dot product with x will always be greater than theta transpose x right that's 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 the take uh, take home summary that you want to add a small uh, uh, scalar times a vector to to theta to make theta be oriented closer to uh, closer to x right and that's the perceptron algorithm adding vector vectors make them make them similar that's the, that's the take home message right? and we saw uh, in fact you you also implemented the perceptron algorithm in uh, i think it was homework 2 where um, we took this algorithm and then kernelized it and, and uh, you guys also you know plotted the separating boundaries and whatnot right so that was that was perceptron and in the perceptron algorithm uh, there is theory which we did not cover in, in the course but there is theory to show that uh, if a separating hyperplane does exist then no matter in what order you present the examples to the learning algorithm it will eventually find some separating hyperplane Right? That was that was uh, that was the the um, uh, property of uh, perceptron algorithms that no matter what uh, what order you present the examples in your stream, um, as long as you as you follow this update rule, if there is a, a separating hyperplane, it will end up recovering that hyperplane. And once you get a a, a separating hyperplane, uh, all the updates beyond that point will always be zero. So, right? so it it would have converged to um, one of the one of the possible separating hyperplanes. And after uh, the perceptron, we moved on to something called the exponential family. So exponential family is a family of probability distributions which have the general form P of Y parameterized by eta is equal to B of Y times exponent of eta transpose T of Y minus a of eta right where y is the is the uh, um, uh, is the variable y is the variable t of y is called the sufficient statistic statistic and for most of the uh, problems that we considered especially with uh, generalized linear models t of y would mostly be equal to y for the purposes of our class so uh, t of y is the sufficient statistics statistic eta is called the natural parameter natural parameter and b of y is called the base measure and a of eta is called the log partition function and this exponential family covers many different kinds of variables exponential families can can um, um, encompasses discrete random variables continuous random variables positive only random variables uh, um, integer uh, random variables um, it, 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 it is pretty uh, pretty flexible in terms of the different kinds of supports the uh, random variable can have and so um, as a consequence when we define a generalized linear model 
generalized linear model where we take an exponential family and set eta equals theta transpose x where theta is now your learnable parameter, learnable parameter that we learned through gradient ascent or descent and x's are the inputs that correspond to y. Right? Once, we, once we kind of connect the inputs and outputs using this linear model, then the, the generalized linear model can therefore be, is, is, is this more general form of regression, classification, you know, um, uh, Poisson regression, etc., where depending on the data type of y or the support of y, we get all these different, different, um, different models. For example, when y is just a real value, you get regression. When y is binary between 0 and 1, you get a classification. And, and um, based on, based on uh, this relation of how we extend exponential family to generalized linear model, where this is the linear model, the sufficient, uh, the uh, natural parameter is, is set equal to uh, theta transpose x. We get these, um, we get these, uh, um, we also showed these special properties. So first of all, the expectation of T of y or in general just the uh, expectation of y where, where uh, T of y equals y is equal to a prime of eta. That is the derivative of the log partition function at eta, evaluated at eta. Okay. And similarly, the variance of y or variance of uh, 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 T of y is equal to the second derivative, a double prime of eta, right? You showed this in uh, homework one, uh, uh, problem four, right? And the, these, these two results can be extended to generalized linear models as well, right? So in generalized linear models, expectation of y given x parameterized by theta is now a prime of theta transpose x times x. Right? It's a simple, simple extension from uh, from from um, exponential family to GLM. So this is exponential family, and this is GLM. Right? And similarly, the variance of y given x parameterized by theta is now a double prime of theta transpose x times x x transpose. Right? And using this property, we showed that generalized linear models are, are uh, uh, what, what we, what we uh, showed is that this term over here is also the Hessian of the log likelihood. So the Hessian of the log likelihood works out to be um, um, this particular formula or in fact it's going to be the sum over all the uh, uh, xi's. And from this, made, uh, this, uh, this term, we can see that the Hessian is always some, um, hang on a moment. I think I wrote it the other way. Uh, this should be on the right. So what, what we showed was that a double prime of, um, a double prime of y, of uh, sorry, of of, uh, of eta will be the variance of y given x parameterized by theta times x x transpose. Yeah, and uh, and here this will be uh, uh, a prime of of um, uh, x uh, uh, of theta will be will be uh, uh, the expectation of, of uh, uh, y given x times um, times x, right? So what we see is that uh, the, it can be shown that the, uh, the, the uh, Hessian of your log likelihood will evaluate to this and this is always positive because it's the variance and this is PSD. Right? 
right. So, the Hessian of the uh, log likelihood of a generalized linear model will always be positive semi definite and therefore convex. This question? So, GLM is when we, um, we take an exponential family, right, and reparameterize the natural parameter with the uh, covariates uh, uh, corresponding to that example. Okay. So, that takes us from exponential family to GLM. In exponential family, you only have y's, there is no x's there, right. If you want to use it as, you know, some kind of a predictive model where given x you want to predict y, this exponential family alone does not work because you, you have only y. Right? And the way you introduce your inputs is by reparameterizing the natural parameter as theta transpose x, where x's are the are the uh, inputs corresponding to y, so and theta are the learnable parameters. I have this question, but I couldn't understand. What uh, additional benefit does this parameter reparameterization give you over, uh, for example, feature transform, feature maps? So feature, uh, uh, good question. So feature maps. Uh, is kind of orthogonal to this. So, you can still use feature maps where instead of theta transpose x, you do theta transpose phi of x. So, you can, you can introduce feature maps into generalized linear models. Uh, so, it is a separate concept introducing feature, uh, feature, uh, feature maps. What, what uh, GLM allows you to do is, is provide you a way to connect y's, y's with x's. Right? Without, without, without uh, a GLM, you, you have only Y's, there is no X's in, in exponential family. So, again, just to make sure I am understanding this right, mm -hmm. maybe taking offline this way, but just to put into place. Um, so, in, in Y equals theta transpose X, that is a linear model. But so, this is, this is eta equals theta transpose X. So, it is more than linear, is that what you are trying to say? So, it, 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 it means that we assume that eta or the natural parameter is equal to theta transpose X and then y is sampled from the exponential family that has this eta, right. That is where the noise comes in. So, y is going to be a noisy version, noisy observation and the noise follows this exponential family and the parameter of the exponential family will be theta transpose x, right. Once you, once you, once you evaluate theta transpose x, you get an eta which will determine the exponential family and from that you assume that the y is going to be a sample from that exponential family. So that's that's uh, exponential family, and then we saw this this um, and then we saw this uh, connection later in the course between exponential families and maximum entropy. Right. So uh, performing maximum likelihood on exponential family. So um, if you are given a data set um, y i you know i equals one one through n, and you perform MLE with some uh, exponential family that is equivalent to performing maximum entropy that is max h of p with the constraint that the um, expectation of some, some um, 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 statistic functions t of y is equal to the sample sample averages i equals 1 to n t of y i. Subject to this constraint, if we maximize the entropy, then you the, the uh, solution that you get will lie in the exponential family and the parameters of that exponential family will be the ones, will be the same parameter that you get by performing maximum likelihood on the exponential family and the sufficient statistics that you used for the constraints are going to be the sufficient statistics of that exponential family, right. So, that is the, you know, it is this uh, duality result where you can, you know, maximum likelihood and maximum entropy are like these uh, dual problems of each other, right. So, that was uh, maximum likelihood and maximum entropy. And then we moved on to something called generative models. In, yes, question? So, you are just saying uh, maximizing your entropy or maximizing your likelihood are equivalent objectives? Well, so, uh, maximizing the entropy subject to these constraints mm -hmm. is the same as maximizing the likelihood of this data set using an exponential family 
that has sufficient statistics equal to these functions. And then we move on to something called generative models. Generative models. So the algorithms until then that we studied were modeling p of y given x, x was considered given, right? We did not assign any kind of probability distribution to x's. Right, they were given, but we we uh, uh, we would assign some kind of a distribution to to uh, y, and then uh, with with generative models, we now instead try to so this was our discriminative models, right? In discriminative models, we just model p of y to given x, whereas in generative models, we actually try to model x as well. Now our interest here is p of y comma x which is generally written as p of x given y times p of y right so this is the joint and over here p of y we generally call it the prior and if y is discrete we call it the class prior right? and p of x given y you can um, uh, think of it as the likelihood function So um, we model both uh, both y's and x's, or x given y's, and depending on the the data type of x, we could either um, um, so x's could either be real valued, real valued, right? Uh, for example, in GDA, y was uh, uh, x was x was uh, real valued, or x could be discrete, discrete valued. And we saw one example of discrete valued x, which was naive base. Right? So these are these are these two generative algorithms that we saw, where uh, both these generative algorithms have discrete y's. So the y's are discrete in, in both these versions, uh, uh, in both these examples. Which means, in a way, we are trying to perform classification because your y's were discrete. Right? But the x's in one one uh, in one case in GDA, x was real val valued. And in the other case, in naive base, x was discrete valued, okay? And for GDA, the the model was something like this. So we assumed p of y, the prior, was some Bernoulli, Bernoulli with uh, parameter p, okay? And p of x given y was from some kind of a normal distribution with mean mu y. So each y had its own mu and a common covariance matrix sigma. Right? So this was this was uh, GDA. And the uh, kind of uh, picture to have in your mind is in GDA we have some x's. So so uh, some 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 x's that come from y equals 0. So let's just call them zero. That that have some kind of a, a covariance structure sigma. Right? So this ellipse kind of um, uh, you know uniquely uh, 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 determines the the uh, covariance sigma. And then there is another uh, another class y. So this corresponds to y equals zero y equals 0 and for y equals 1 we have this other that has that is so the assumption is that y equals 1 also is distributed according to a gaussian with the same covariance structure as y equals 0 right so this is y equals 1 so this is this is the picture to have in uh, uh, about GDA, where uh, until we we uh, st studied generative algorithms, we were not even visualizing x, right? So we would only focus on you know what y was. We would plot, um, 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 uh, you think of think of uh, uh, y and and modeling y. But now we are trying trying to assign probabilities to x it, x directly, right? So this is x one, x two.
x1 or xd okay. and because of this equal covariance the the posterior of phi of y given x phi of y given x takes a form of 1 over 1 plus exponent of minus something right and that's because it's it's easy to see that if both of them have this this uh, um, um, equal covariance structure and suppose both of them have an equal number of examples then the line that or the, the, the set of all points that gets equal likelihood both from the class 1 Gaussian and the class 2 Gaussian is going to be some straight line right and, and that kind of corresponds to um, uh, uh, a form which can be expressed as a logistic regression because uh, in logistic regression we also got uh, linear separating boundaries right. Now if the equal covariance assumption is not met so instead if we had a normal with mu a mean corresponding to the class and also co covariance corresponding to the class then we would have gotten instead norm uh, one covariance that looks like this another covariance probably looks like this right and now the uh, set of all points that get equal likelihood under both these classes would probably look something like this right it wouldn't be a straight line anymore it would be a quadratic so that's that's GDA. The posterior of the GDA is uh, um, is a logistic uh, takes on a logistic regression form. You, you saw that in PS1, Q1, right? And we also kind of uh, uh, briefly discussed, you know, what are the cases when you want to use logistic regression directly, and what are the cases when you want to use GDA? Uh, yes, question. Well, so in this case, um, uh, so the question is do we get uh, a logistic as a posterior in this case? Uh, you can show that you do get a logistic uh, as a posterior in this case, but that logistic will have quadratic uh, form, uh, quadratic features of x's. Right? So you can show that this, this takes on uh, a logistic regression form, except that the, the, uh, it's a logistic where you include quadratic features of your x's. So, 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 uh, so, so the, the question of why we assume something, the answer is always if you assume something, you get this, right? And, and you know, why you assume something is most of the times it's because it gives you some kind of a mathematical convenience and then you kind of measure up against real data whether the assumption was reasonable or not, right? That's, that's in general, that's going to be the answer for why we assume something for anything, you know, mostly in this course and in general, right? Uh, you know, making some assumptions gives you you know some kind of mathematical convenience maybe you know easy to implement or you know convexity or, or whatever and that assumption may or may not hold true and then um, so you make that assumption you know build a model or whatever and then you fit your data and see if that assumption was valid or not this question Yeah, so I'm coming. I mean, I'm coming to that uh, right away. So then we kind of uh, um, uh, kind of uh, ask the question, you know, what, under what some circumstances do we want to use logistic regression, and when do we want to use GDA, right? And the 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 answer to that is, if you don't have a lot of data, and also if you are pretty sure that the modeling assumptions hold true, in those set of situations, using generative models. Is, is going to be beneficial over using logistic regression. However, if you have lots of data and you know, you're, you're not too sure of whether the modeling assumptions hold true or not, then you're better off using logistic regression. In logistic regression, we made no assumption about, the, about how x's are distributed. We only modeled p of y given x, and x was assumed to be given. So logistic regression is, in general, more robust to the kinds of uh, excess that that you may uh, uh, you may you may actually encounter however in examples where the assumptions hold gda will be more sample efficient right you need a lot fewer examples when the assumptions hold with gda as opposed to logistic regression 
and and that's that answer kind of holds for you know all generative models um, when you want to when you want to learn um, um, some kind of um, um, machine learning model right so when you want to build a model you can kind of give information to it either through assumptions or you can give it information from data right and as long as your assumptions are true feeding those assumptions is beneficial and you have these other uh, in this other case so in, in in gda in these generative models you are feeding in a lot more assumptions a lot more prior knowledge right and as long as those knowledge is is uh, as long as those assumptions is is true it is beneficial you need a lot less data to make up for um, um, uh, for the information right in discriminative models you are feeding a lot fewer assumptions you are saying nothing about x's at all right which means you need to make up for that lack of information that you're feeding by having more data right? and it, it, it fits the data no matter how you know uh, uh, it fits the data better because you're just making fewer assumptions about how the data is supposed to be right? so that's that's going to be a common difference between or a common uh, way to think about when you want to use generative models versus when you want to use discriminative models right so that was uh, gda and then we kind of moved on to naive base naive base in naive base the naive base is, is uh, an algorithm that's commonly used with text classification right uh, in text classification the inputs or the x's are discrete you know they are discrete words that make up a sentence or a message and in naive base we kind of saw these um, so first of all in naive base we make this conditional independence assumption the conditional independence assumption tells us that x i is independent of x j given y which means if you know what the class is whether you know for example if you're doing spam classification y can be 0 or 1 uh, spam versus no spam if you know what the class is then the probability of observing one word is independent of the probability of uh, uh, observing another word right this does not mean x i is independent of x j right so independence and conditional independence are two two uh, kind of orthogonal properties uh, being conditionally independent says nothing about being independent and vice versa right in in uh, naive base we make this conditional independence assumption that if we know the class then the probability of one word occurring is independent of the probability of other words occurring Right? and this this assumption may or may not hold true in practice but um, but it so happens that even when these assumptions are not met the models tend to work reasonably well with text uh, or textual data especially for classification yes question sorry that that uh, doesn't hold right oh sorry yeah, yeah that doesn't hold yeah. and we saw two two different uh, event models called the uh, Bernoulli event model, Bernoulli event model, and the and the multinomial event model. Multinomial event model, right? So the difference between the, these two is in um, in both of in both of uh, um, both of these event models, we assume p of y is equal to p y p of y equals p y right so this is the uh, class prior class prior class prior right? so the class prior is what fraction of all the messages that you encounter will be spammy in general right without even looking at the messages uh, of of the uh, content of the messages that's just the uh, class prior and then in the uh, Bernoulli event model we say p of x j given y is equal to c j given y according to uh, uh, again this is a Bernoulli distribution Bernoulli distribution what that means is over here xj is the jth 
word in the vocabulary. What this means is uh, we have one parameter per word in the vocabulary per class okay? and the, the, uh, what, the, what the parameter signifies is the probability that uh, the word, the jth word in the vocabulary occurs in a given message. So the, um, on, the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the other hand with the multinomial event model we have P of xj given y is equal to is as, um, equal to phi j given given y where this is the is the uh, jth multinomial distribution parameter or the categorical distribution parameter multinomial distribution and xj here refers to the jth word in a message. Right? So, in the in the Bernoulli event model, we care about what fraction of the message the word occurs versus does not occur. We don't care how many times the word occurs in that message. Okay? We are just we are just uh, counting what fraction of the messages does this word occur versus not occur. It may occur 10,000 times in a message, but we just count it once that it occurred in this message. Whereas in the multinomial event model, we are trying to build a histogram of, of words that occur in all the messages of a given, uh, uh, of a given class. Right? So um, here we basically end up counting the number of times the word repeats across all messages in spammy uh, emails. And similarly, the number of times a word occurs across all messages in non-spammy emails, right? And um, and then uh, we count them uh, and normalize them to get a multinomial distribution over the words. So that's a multinomial event model. Whereas in the Bernoulli event model, we kind of treat each word in the vocabulary as a separate problem, and estimates estimate the the uh, Bernoulli parameter of what fraction of messages does this word occur in, in the spammy emails uh, or not? This question? Uh, yeah, the way I think about it, like can you confirm if this is the, uh, right way? Basically, multinomial is in the same as Bernoulli, but what we do is we concatenate all the non spammy messages and concatenate all the spammy messages and treat them as two big messages and then just use them. Uh, that's not the case. So uh, um, the, the, uh, the, the question was, in, uh, in multinomial, do you think of it as taking all the spammy messages, concatenating it as one big message, take all the you know, non-spammy messages, concatenate against one big message, take those two big messages and perform Bernoulli? Uh, that's not the case uh, because in Bernoulli, we are only, we, we are uh, counting the number of times or rather the number of messages in which a word appears. So if you collapse everything into one message, then the answer is always zero or one. Does that appear in that one large message or not? Whereas in, in uh, multinomial, what you want to do is actually count the number of times the word repeats across all messages, right? So the two, the, 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 those two are, 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 uh, are need not be the same. Right? And then um, we also saw this concept called Laplace smoothing, where in Laplace smoothing is a technique to handle rare words, where you know words need, um, may uh, may occur very uh, infrequently. And in Laplace smoothing, the idea is. For each of the uh, two different uh, uh, event models, first kind of pre-count that each event happens once and starting with a count of one for each of the events, then look at the data and in start incrementing the counters. Right? That's, that's the general idea of, of Laplace smoothing where you want to start with, instead of starting with a zero prior, where a zero prior means you have no idea whether a message is, you know, a, a word occurs in a, a spammy email or not. Start with a prior where you assume you've seen, um, you know, one one count of each event, right? Now, so that means uh, in the in the Bernoulli case, each word assume that you've seen it once in a spammy email and once in a non-spammy email. Then you start incrementing the counters by looking at the emails and seeing whether uh, and and checking whether the word occurred in it or not, right? And similarly, in uh, the multinomial event model, assume that um, every word occurs once in the spam class 
or the spam pool of messages and occurs once in the non spam pool of messages and then construct the histogram of words from you know this pool and that pool by adding on to that one right and then normalize it so that's laplace moving and that kind of wraps up generative models so those were basically the two models that we saw gda and naive bayes gda was for continuous access naive bayes was for discrete access and then uh, after after uh, uh, generative models we moved on to kernel methods so with kernel methods the the motivation for kernel methods is having some kind of an efficient way to introduce feature maps right so we saw feature maps in homework 1 the last question where we implemented polynomial features for linear regression and we saw that by using feature maps even though we are fitting a linear model the hypothesis that we get can be quite non linear or quite curvy right so linear regression is linear in its parameters or linear in its features it's not always linear in the uh, with respect to the original data so by introducing these features we can get you know a pretty complex non linear models and kernel methods is a way to to uh have these non linear features in an efficient way so a kernel so in order to define a kernel we start with a feature map kernel methods right so we start with a feature map p of x right that takes from r d to r p right where x is in r d that's the data that's given to you right and p is the uh uh uh, uh the dimension of the feature space and importantly p can be infinite okay and now we define a kernel based on this feature map and say that a kernel corresponding to a kernel is a function of two inputs let's call it x and x prime corresponding to a feature map if it evaluates to p of x transpose p of x prime right so a kernel takes as input two x's like you know before you map them to a, a high dimensional feature space and it evaluates the uh, output to have the same value as that you would get by mapping them to the high dimensional feature space and taking an inner product so mathematically these two are equivalent but computationally or algorithmically the kernel would generally perform some kind of a more efficient computation that gives you the same answer as if you had constructed an explicit feature map and done an inner product between them right so that those are kernels so kernels uh, are functions of of uh, x and x prime corresponding to some feature map such that they evaluate to you know mathematically evaluate to the same answer as you would have uh, uh, obtained from the explicit feature map construction and then um there are a few properties of of uh kernels so a, a function k is a kernel if it is symmetric if it is um symmetric and if you were to take a collection of examples x1 through uh um so if you were to take x1 through let's say x um correct m and construct a kernel matrix so a kernel matrix is then a matrix of m by m right and these examples can be any examples these need not be a training set take any possible uh, examples uh, you can you can uh, uh, come up with and if you evaluate k of x1 x1 k of x1 xm and similarly k of xm xm k of 
m x1. So evaluate the uh, kernel function on every pairwise uh, on every pair of uh, uh, of, of uh, two two uh, two choices from this set, and this matrix that you obtain, where each of these is just a scalar, right? Each of these is a scalar, and you get this uh, matrix, which is also called the kernel matrix. This kernel matrix will be symmetric and positive semi-definite. And we saw, we also saw this uh, this theorem called Mercer's theorem. Mercer's theorem, which says, in order for a function k to be a kernel, it is necessary and sufficient for the corresponding kernel matrix to be symmetric and positive semi-definite. Right. So the the um, so the uh, kernel matrix being symmetric and positive semi-definite is both a property of kernels, which means it is uh, a necessary condition, and Mercer's theorem uh, tells us that it's also a sufficient condition that for any k, if this property holds, then k must be a kernel function, right? And the Mercer's theorem, um, you know, one one loose intuition there is the Mercer's theorem is essentially telling us that. Uh, any sub matrix of a positive semi definite matrix is also positive semi definite so you can think of kernels as these uh, psd functions which are infinite dimensional uh, and a kernel matrix is you know a, a choice of for some choice of specific input values evaluate the kernel at those points and extract it into a matrix and Mercer's theorem essentially tells you that you know any sub matrix of this infinite dimensional uh, PSD matrix or PSD function must also uh, if, um, is necessarily PS, uh, a positive semi definite and vice versa. Yes, question. So where does x1 to xm come from? It can be any x1 through xm, any arbitrary x1 through xm, right? any example. They need not be your training set. Right? It's, it's just a property of this of this uh, function. Right. So that was that was uh, kernels. Um, yes, question. So uh, you know the the uh, Mercer's theorem tells us that so this infinite dimensional space that you see you th think of this as the function k uh, where this is one input the other input and the values here are the the values that the function evaluates to right and now uh, think of this as an infinite dimensional matrix right and now if you just you know extract the evaluations of this function at certain points right so this corresponds to x1 this corresponds to x2 uh, and this corresponds to xm and similarly this corresponds to x1 you know, xm right so basically you are just extracting these these um, extracting a sub matrix out of this infinite dimensional matrix here right and mercer's theorem is uh, is a is another uh, um, is another way to say that uh, a matrix in this case the infinite dimensional matrix is positive semi definite if and only if any sub matrix is positive semi definite so that's that's uh, that's Mercer's theorem, and that's uh, kernels, and the kernel trick is basically uh, if we can rewrite our algorithm to be represented as inner products of x's, then we can replace those inner products with kernel functions, right? And that basically allows us to redefine parameters. So if this is our design matrix X, where you have n examples and let's call it uh, uh, p features so so this is phi of x right so there's some feature map and uh, you have you have uh, p features and n examples right um, in the simplistic approach in in the in the naive approach we would define a theta vector right so we would define a theta vector in our P, you know, if, if you've used a feature map P, and then we would use some kind of a gradient descent to keep updating these uh, theta vectors with each time step by minimizing a loss. Right? So I uh, think of this as theta at time zero, and then theta at time one, theta at time two, and so on. And gradient descent gives us uh, updated uh, theta vectors. With the kernel method, we can basically flip it around and say we define one coefficient 
per example. So, this would be call it beta 0, where we have one element per example, which kind of sets the weight of that uh, example in a way. Right? And with, with kernel methods, we keep obtaining these updated beta vectors. So, gradient descent keeps hopping us from here to here and similarly, if you, if you kernelize it, you, you, uh, you work with coefficients for different examples. Right? And this, this method therefore, basically allows us uh, to have infinite dimensional feature maps. Right? The naive method would start failing as you extended p to infinity because you need to maintain vectors of that length. Whereas, with kernel methods, we are maintaining a vector of length equal to number of examples. And so, even, even uh, this kind of allows you to use infinitely long feature maps. And we, we use kernel, the, uh, uh, the kernel version to evaluate the, um, evaluate, uh, uh, the infinite dimensional uh, inner products in some inexpensive way. And we maintain uh, finite dimensional um, uh, coefficient vectors, right? So that's that's a kernel. That's the kernel trick. We um, in the notes we have we have uh, described how to use the apply the kernel uh, kernel trick to linear regression. And in one of the homework problems, you kernelize the perceptron algorithm, right? In the perceptron algorithm, not only did you kernelize it, but you also made it work in a streaming setting where you're obtaining one example at a time and the beta vector. Would be extended as you keep and as you kept encountering new examples. Right. So the uh, that was from uh, kernelizing the perceptron. Right. And then we we briefly covered support vector machines. So support vector machine is a kernel-based classification algorithm. A kernelized perceptron is also a kernel-based classification algorithm. The, the support vector machine, however, focuses on something called as the geometric margin that defines the separating hyperplane, right? The, uh, the algorithms such as logistic regression try to maximize the functional margin, which is different from the uh, geometric margin. And you saw the distinction between functional margin and geometric margin in the, uh, um, again, in, in uh, uh, P set 2 question 1 on training stability of, of uh, logistic regression, where logistic regression by trying to maximize the functional margin would keep extending the margin all the way to plus infinity because it found a well, a, 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 a hyperplane that could be separated and it would just gain for free uh, a, a higher functional margin by just scaling all the values up and it would just keep uh, scaling it forever. Whereas with support vector machine, you don't have such problems because you're trying to maximize the geometric margin and the geometric margin is the geometric margin uh, because it's a geometric concept, right? And the support vector machine also has this other nice benefit that the coefficient vector that you end up with at the end of training is gonna be sparse. By sparse, it means that most of them will be zeros except a few examples, the rest will all be zeros. Right? And these few examples which have a non-zero coefficient are also called the support vectors. Right? So the idea there is, let's say you have a, you know, some classes over here and another class over here with examples. Support vector machine tries to find this separating hyperplane that maximizes the geometric margin between the two classes. And in order to uh, decide this, this uh, exact position of the separating hyperplane, all what matters are these nearest examples from both the classes, right? And these two, these two uh, subsets of examples end up being the support vectors and the, the, uh, the location of the other examples don't matter. So they get a coefficient of zero but the nearest examples end up having non-zero coefficients and th those are also called the uh, support vectors, right? So support vector machines are, are, are kind of this nice, um, they have this nice benefit that you can use kernel methods 
and get scalability in terms of features to infinite dimensions. But also, unlike other kernel methods where you need to hold on to the training, the entire training set into test time, support vector machines allow you to hold on to just these few support vectors into test time. Right? So, so the sparse dual coefficients, so the sparse uh, coefficients that you get from support vector machines gives you this nice benefit that you get scalability in terms of number of features and also scalability in terms of number of examples because you are only going to hold on to you know a few support vectors into test time. Whereas with other kernel, kernel methods you generally need to hold on to the entire training set into test time. So that was our support vector machines. And then we moved on to another kind of kernel algorithm called Gaussian processes. Right? Gaussian processes. So Gaussian processes is a kernel method for regression. Right? So support vector machine and kernelized perceptron were kernel methods for classification. Right? Gaussian processes is a kernel method for regression. And with Gaussian processes, the the uh, the way we we um, define Gaussian processes is to generalize Gaussian distributions to infinite dimensions, right? And in infinite dimensions, uh, so if we have a Gaussian vector, right, of you know uh, of a certain dimension that has a certain mean and a certain covariance. In a Gaussian process, you have this function where you are visualize, where we are uh, thinking of function as an infinitely long vector, right? So it's, it's, it's like a continuous version of an array of, uh, of, of a vector which extends to infinity, right? And this is a, a Gaussian process that has a mean function Right, which is again infinite dimension and instead of a matrix you have a covariance function k. Right? So a Gaussian process is this infinite dimension extension of a multivariate Gaussian distribution right? and there are certain properties of multivariate Gaussian distribution that makes marginalization easy. So if you want to marginalize out one of the, one of the uh, components of a Gaussian uh, distribution, you just ignore that component in the mean and ignore that row and column in the covariance function, right? So marginalization is very easy in, in Gaussian distribution. So one way to think of the way we uh, apply Gaussian processes to, um, uh, to uh, a given uh, data set is to, uh, it is an incorrect, uh, uh, technically incorrect, but very useful in terms of uh, understanding that you have this infinite dimensional Gaussian vector and we marginalize out everything that is outside our training set and test set, right? So choose only those points in this infinite, infinite uh, dimensional uh, vector. Choose that finite subset of points where that finite subset is made up of examples in our training set and examples in our test set. And that basically kind of condenses this infinitely, uh, infinite long mean function into a finite dimensional mean vector and an infinite, you know, a, a covariance function into a covariance matrix. And this covariance matrix that you, that you obtain is exactly like this. How you obtain a kernel matrix uh, with kernel methods, you obtain a covariance matrix uh, by using uh, the kernel function. And we saw that a kernel matrix must always be positive semi-deferent, Morse's theorem told us, and covariance uh, functions uh, or covariance matrices need to be positive semi-deferent, so that kind of matches up, right? And once we obtain this, we just use the uh, conditioning of Gaussian distributions to condition on the training set and obtain posterior on the test set, on, on the examples that we want to make uh, prediction, right? So that's, that's Gaussian processes. The mathematical notation can be a little messy, uh, 
but uh, essentially what's happening there is is just this right marginalize out everything that's not necessary and use the conditioning rules like the rules themselves are heavy on notation but you know you just plug the the uh, the, uh, the the correct pieces into the conditioning uh, rule and you get your predictive distribution on on unseen examples right so that's that's gaussian process any questions on that yeah yes question yeah, good question. So, what kernel do we use? And generally, the choice of kernel is a hyperparameter that you tune. You try different kernels and see what best, uh, what works best, instead of giving you good predictive power on a validation set. Right? You generally, you generally play around with a few different kernels and and choose one that works best for you. So, the the uh, choice of which kernel you want to use is somewhat equivalent to the question of asking what feature map do you want to use with linear regression it's 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 very similar right so then we moved on to neural networks so with neural networks you want to think of neural networks as these complex differentiable layer wise or composite functions that have parameters at all layers with nonlinearities right so imagine um, you are given you're feeding an input vector x into a model right? so this is x in r d and so we're going to we're going to talk about uh, what's commonly called as as uh, fully connected networks this is one specific architecture of neural networks where you start with uh, um, the input x that you're feeding into your model and you take it through these hidden layers where from the input layer this is called you know you can think of it as layer 0 you go to hidden layer 1 by multiplying this by a matrix w w x plus some bias b and running all of these through some nonlinearity g right so g of w x plus b will give you this vector Right? So w w is a, a, a parameter that you want to learn, right? and x is the input that's going in. B is another set of parameters that you want to learn. G is some element-wise nonlinearity, like the sigmoid function, for example. Right? And depending on the dimension of w, right, w will generally uh, be r. Uh, let's let's uh, um, um, let's call this. Uh, k by d right so wx will therefore be let's call it rk where this has um, a k components in it right? and this had d components in it and then we basically uh, perform perform uh, another layer of the same so g of so if this is w1 you have another w2 of of this which let's call it a1 plus b2 right and so on eventually we bring it down to one scalar which we call it as y hat right and then corresponding to this x there is another y so you take the output of the network take the actual output and combine the two into some kind of a loss right? and this loss is a scalar these these outputs and labels could possibly be be vectors so if you're doing multi-class classification this would give you the, this would be like the output of softmax so it would be a full vector and the uh, true true uh, label would be a one hot vector of what the correct answer is right and but the loss is always a scalar valued loss right that's that's uh, that's the uh, common convention so you start with a scalar-valued loss, 
and now we want to we want to calculate the the uh, the gradient of this loss with respect to every parameter and every layer and in order to calculate that we use an algorithm called back propagation and back propagation is essentially just the multivariate uh, 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 chain rule of calculus right so the way you want to think of back propagation is always start with one scalar parameter let's say w um, uh, ij and try to calculate the partial of loss with respect to partial of w ij of some layer l right and this will always must always evaluate to a scalar because you're you're calculating the the gradient of a scalar with respect to a scalar and the intermediate steps to calculate this will involve you know going from the scalar to a vector and from vector to vector vector to vector and finally vector to scalar right and so um, and each of those intermediate components are called jacobians right going from vector to vector and and um, uh, so each of those intermediate uh, um, uh, are called jacobians and you will encounter you will generally see that the that the chain of jacobians that you encounter while calculating uh, this will generally be you know you have a row vector matrix 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 and finally a column vector right? and once once you once you multiply them out this will just evaluate to a scalar okay? this this is this is uh, going to be common and for layers where you are uh, performing a nonlinearity the jacobian will be a diagonal matrix and for computational reasons you you know you you might want to instead of uh, uh, implementing as a, a diagonal matrix you might just want to do element wise multiplication right so uh, perform this for every possible uh, uh, parameter in the network and then you can use some um, um, you can identify common patterns and define update rule for the entire matrix in a more compact uh, compact form Right? and the, so so all the, all that is basically just algebraic manipulation but the goal that we are uh, trying to achieve is to calculate the gradient of the loss which is scalar with respect to every scalar parameter right? and once we, once you calculate these gradients it's basically just gradient descent right perform gradient descent on all these parameters simultaneously take a small step to minimize the loss with respect to all these parameters and take a small step and you know repeat until you converge so that was neural networks uh, and back propagation and after neural networks we moved on to some learning theory basically bias variance analysis so bias variance analysis is probably the most important concept from from the entire course and it's this bias variance analysis that distinguishes machine learning from say you know optimization right in in uh, in general optimization problems you are given some kind of a function or an objective and you want to maximize or minimize it right and we use such optimization techniques like gradient methods newton's method um, or even just closed form expressions for maximizing or minimizing uh, some kind of a loss right but what distinguishes machine learning from just optimization is the bias variance trade off which means uh, what, what what it actually means is our end goal is not really minimizing the training objective itself yes we are we are minimizing the training objective but our goal really is to perform well on unseen data right and we are kind of doing this minimization of the training loss as a proxy with the hope that we are going to do well on test data right so the the uh, uh, um, bias variance analysis is is a way to kind of decompose our test error or the encounter the the uh, error that we encounter at test time and break it down into sub components uh, for bias various and irreducible error right so irreducible error uh, and and this decomposition generally uh, holds true for all losses but in the in, in the specific case of a squared error loss we get a very clean decomposition that mean squared error you know on test set or on a test example is the sum of irreducible error plus bias square 
plus variance. Right? The, the fundamental assumption is that our data is noisy right? and this noise can, can, uh, can affect our test error in two ways. So first of all, the test example that we are going to encounter itself is going to be noisy. Right? And so the noise in the test example contributes to irreducible error. Right? So this is noise in test example. This basically tells us that no matter what model you choose, right? choose the best possible model that can possibly be, you know, uh, 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 possibly be imagined. Even that model is going to encounter some error at test time because your test data itself is noisy. Right? So that's irreducible error. No matter what model you get, you're going, to, you, you're going to pay this irreducible error penalty no matter what. Right? And then the bias and variance are basically, um, so you can think of the, the noise in the training data that you have to be contributed, to be contributing to, to variance. So training data noise contributes to the variance of the model, right? And bias is more or less uh, kind of telling you how inflexible your model is, right? So your data may be, may be saying some story, of course a noisy story of how, of, 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 of the pattern between your x's and y's, but the model that you have may be limited to just linear models, even though your data has a cle clear, let's say, you know, quadratic relationship x and y where you know, there's a clear quadratic linear uh, relationship between x's and y's if you happen to choose linear models then obviously your model is biased because you're limited to solutions that look like this right so so bias is mostly due to um, inflexibility in your in your uh, um, model class inflexibility or limited capacity of model class and variance is due to noise in, 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 in your uh, training data, right? And so our goal is to not minimize the training loss, but our goal is to actually minimize the test loss. Right, or the test error. And this test error has one component called irreducible error for which we can do nothing about. So we focus on just bias and variance. Right? And the, the kind of action space that we have includes kind of contradictory actions. Right? So some action, you know, one action is you know, increase regularization. And increasing regularization will reduce variance but there is also another action called reduce regularization, which will, re which will, which will uh, uh, fight bias. So in order to decide which action you want to take, you want to get a good sense of how, what is the contribution of bias versus what's the contribution of variance in your test error. And a loose proxy for that is you can think of bias as training error and variance as gap between test or validation and training error. Right? So bias technically is not the training error, but for the purposes of choosing the action to take, it works as a, as a, as a sufficient proxy to think of a bias as training error. So if your training error is very high, then you want to take steps that fight bias. So in that way, it's, it's, it's a reasonable proxy for the purposes of the bias variance analysis to think of bias as the training error. And the variance is the gap between the, the, the test and, and uh, um, test or validation and, and training error. Right? And we, we also discussed some, some actions uh, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the previous class of what, what, what actions help fight bias versus what action helps fight variance. And before you take any action, you always, always want to get a breakdown of test error and train error and, and uh, kind of make a, a judgment call of whether 
you're facing a high bias problem or facing a high variance problem and accordingly take an action that will reduce your overall test error. Right? So that's, that's bias variance problem. And this methodology, this bias variance way of thinking holds for classification, holds for regression, holds for supervised, holds for unsupervised. It, and it is, it, is, it is kind of this, this topic that permeates all, of, all the models and all the algorithms that we consider and it's probably the most useful when you're applying your model, uh, applying uh, machine learning for a new problem that you're working on in practice. Because the new, the, the new algorithm that you're working on in practice might be you know, an algorithm that, you've, that we've not studied in this class, for example, random forests, but you can apply bias variance for that algorithm as well. It works for all algorithms. Right? So that was, that was a bias variance analysis. Then we studied regularization and a gave a Bayesian interpretation for regularization. Right? So regularization um, is a way in which you add a penalty for large values of your parameters, where the intuition is that large values of parameters can result in very complex models. And in order to kind of minimize the complexity of our models, we want to limit the the, the uh, values or the magnitudes of, the, of our parameters. And so we, uh, if our, um, um, so our loss, you know, if it's generally some kind of i equals one, i equals one to n, let's say y i minus h theta of x i square. If this is our regular loss, we want to augment it with some kind of a penalty for the loss, or for, for the parameters uh, being too large, right? And you can either, uh, uh, there are several choices here. You may sometimes want to penalize the one norm uh, of the, of the uh, parameters. And we, we saw that uh, adding, adding the two norm for the parameters is equal, is, has this Bayesian interpretation of performing MAP estimation with Gaussian prior. Right? And with one uh, with, with the one norm is equivalent to performing MAP estimation with the Laplace prior. Right? And in your homework you also saw how to how you know what the exact value of these lambda terms should be depending on the parameters of the Gaussian and Laplace distribution. So that was regularization. And after that, we moved on to reinforcement learning. Right? Reinforcement learning is this, this um, is slightly different from the other algorithms in the sense that in the other algorithms, we make this IID assumption, where for each prediction, each prediction or each example is completely independent of another example uh, on which we're making a prediction. Instead, in reinforcement learning, we are in this sequential decision making uh, situation where the predictions that we make at one, uh, uh, at one situation will, choose, will, will, will uh, result in some action being taken and that action will decide the next state that we are end up with and therefore decide the next situation where our prediction is being made. Right? So the examples, if you think of each time step um, in, in reinforcement learning as an example. These examples are not IID anymore. They're all kind of correlated. Okay? And in order to formalize reinforcement learning, we define something called an MDP or a Markov decision process. And that's a tuple of states, actions, transition probabilities, PSA, in fact, a set of uh, transition probabilities, a discount factor, and a reward function. Right? So the reward function, so we can be in one of the many states, which is defined by the set S, we can take one of the many actions defined by the set of actions A, and depending on which state we are and what action we take, we end up in a new state, and that transition or the dynamics of moving to the next state is captured by this, uh, uh, this, this set of transition probability vectors, PSA, and at each state, when we arrive at a state, 
we obtain a reward that is defined by the reward function and there is this discount factor called gamma which, which basically tells the rewards that are obtained sooner are better than rewards obtained later right? and gamma is generally a value between 0 and 1. So this is the, the formalism in which we, we, uh, we uh, attack the reinforcement learning problem and based on this MDP we define these two um, kind of related concepts called value and policy. Right? So value and policy. So policy is a mapping from state to action. Right? It is like a rule book. If you are in a particular state, what is the action that we should take? Right? This rule book is called the policy. And the value v that corresponds to a policy pi of a given state is basically telling us if we were to start in the, a state S and were to continue the trajectory by taking actions according to the policy pi, right, which means when you are in state S, take action according to you know, uh, the value pi of S evaluates to and that action according to the dynamics is going to take to a random new state and in that new state which is random refer to the rule book and take an action according to that policy right and so on and if we were to repeat this this pro, uh, this process over and over where each time you know you, you you can end up in a different state according to the dynamics what is the average accumulated sum of discounted rewards and that is 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 captured by this function called v pi this question just the concepts of policy and value right so policy is just a rule book right and value is the is the long term reward that you're going to accumulate by starting at s and following the rule book pi right and and these two concepts you know uh, policy and value are are kind of related so if you are given a policy pi you can perform something called as policy evaluation and get v pi or v pi right and to get v pi you can you can you can obtain v pi using a simple uh, 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 set of linear linear equations you can just solve a linear equations and get uh, the values uh, for for all the different states and if you are at if if you are given some policy v that policy kind of implicitly defines a, a, I think I said it wrong. If you are given a value function v, that value function v implicitly defines a policy where the policy is to take action in a greedy way to maximize the, the value of the next state. Right? So, um, so, so pi of s is equal to org max of a expectation of v of s prime where s prime comes from p s a right choose an action that is going to maximize the expected value of the next state right so value implicitly defines a policy and a policy defines a value however the subtlety is that this cycle is not is 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 not the inverse of the other direction which means a policy will will give you a particular value function but then if you take this value function and try to calculate the policy that that um, um, acts greedily according to this value function you will not get the same policy again right and that asymmetry is what is captured in policy iteration so policy iteration is an algorithm where we start with a random policy, evaluate the corresponding value function and take that evaluation uh, value function and re-estimate the best possible policy you can come up and then re-evaluate re re uh, the new policy, the, the new value function according to the policy and go on and on until you converge, right. So that is policy, policy uh, uh, iteration until your policy converges. Until your policy converges. 
And then there is this other, other uh, algorithm called value iteration. Right? In value iteration, we have this, this uh, thing called the, the uh, Bellman equation. In the uh, and the goal in in uh, in in the value iteration is to estimate this function called v star, which is called the optimal value function. And v star of s is basically you know r max of pi of v of s. So basically. Uh, Now, what is the best possible value that you can have for a given state if you were to scan across all possible policies? Right? So that's that's uh, the optimal value function. And this optimal value function, if you were to plug it here, the policy that you're going to recover is the optimal policy. Right? This question. Yeah, you're right. This should this should just be yeah. You're right. Thank you. So this just should be a max, right? So the the uh, idea with uh, uh, with with value iteration is that uh, value iteration has you perform this update rule where v of s you set it equal to v of s plus um, I'm sorry r of s plus um, gamma times max A T of A of S pi, right? So this this is um, this is also called the uh, uh, the Bellman backup operator, where if you were to perform this over and over, you will recover v star. And the intuition to have here is, um, if this is the space of all value functions, so this is a v of s one through v of s s, right? All the possible uh, value functions. There is this optimal. V star, and no matter where you start, right? So you you can call this as uh, th this operator as you know V is equal to Bellman of of V, right? So take any two value uh, or any two value functions, run both of them through the Bellman operator, right? Now the distance between these two will always be smaller than the distance between the original two, right? This distance will always be smaller, which means the Bellman backup operator uh, or the Bellman operator is a contraction mapping, right? So the space is getting, um, um, if, if, if you were to r run your examples over and over uh, with these Bellman uh, operators, then they are kind of converging, right? And whenever you have a contraction mapping, there exists this point called the fixed point, and this fixed point is the the optimal value function, right? So the uh, um, the value iteration takes your value function from any space, from any point in the space. You keep applying the Bellman operator, you're going to eventually uh, converge to the fixed point, right? So that's that's a uh, uh, value iteration running this over and over. And we we also saw this other um, we also saw a, a variant of this called fitted value iteration. Right? So fitted value iteration, where in fitted value iteration, we, we limit ourselves, you know, so supposing this is V star, we limit ourselves to a class of value functions. 
in this class of value functions, let's say this, this could be the class that is like the output of a neural network or a linear model, you know, any, 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 uh, some class of value functions where we start with some point, you know, some theta that, that parameterizes this uh, value function. And on this, we apply the Bellman backup operator. The Bellman backup operator will take us to some new value function, which may be outside our parameter space, right? And then we project this back onto, so this, this Bellman operator, take, operator takes us here. And then we project it back onto our class by, by trying to fit this, this uh, value function from a function in our class, say, you know, uh, say, uh, by minimizing the least square or, or uh, some such loss function, right? So that's like projecting this new function back into the class. And from here, again, apply the Bellman uh, operator, you get a new function projected back, right? Again, apply the Bellman operator, right? And then project it back, right? And this is called the fitted value iteration, where you are staying within this parameter, uh, th this parameterized family of, of functions, and the iteration takes you closer and closer to, to V star. Right? But uh, this algorithm is not guaranteed to converge right? because this is not a true contraction mapping anymore. Right? There's, no, there's, no, um, uh, there's no fixed point for this. Uh, and, but however, in practice, it, it tends to work well. Right? So that's, that's uh, uh, fitted value iteration. We, um, in, in your homework, you implemented uh, value iteration for the inverted pendulum problem. Right? We did not do fitted value iteration in the homework. We implemented this, and you also uh, implemented this in the context where PSA was not known. Right? So in the in the homework, by by running your um, a simulator, we also learned the transition probabilities as a separate problem, and using the the uh, estimated transition probabilities, we learned the uh, uh, val we performed the value iteration. This question. Yeah, so how would fitted value iteration look in code? So in, co in, in, in the homework, you represented value as some vector, right? I've, whose length was the number of states you had, right? In, um, which meant you could set each element of this value function freely to any value, right? You could, you could, you could set this and not worry about what value was here, right? In fitted value iteration, you are no longer representing your value function explicitly as an array, but instead you will have you, V of S will be some, some um, let's call it H theta of S. So S will be the input to the model. The output of the model will be the corresponding value. Okay. Right? So this is fitted value iteration. Exactly. So initially, with 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 Bellman uh, backup operator, we directly work with this array and apply the Bellman backup operator until this entire array converges. Right? With fitted value iteration, uh, we describe the algorithm uh, in the class, and it's also in the notes. Um, we we limit ourselves to a representation like this. It's no longer an explicit array, right? And on this, we we apply the Bellman uh, backup operator, obtain something called y. And then find a new theta, new theta uh, arg min of h theta of s minus y square, something like this. Okay? So we are kind of projecting the y back to the theta space. So the assumption, so the block that we give that that's the, that's a, let's say for example a linear assumption. So it's the, your value can be expressed. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So this could be a linear model where you represent your value as theta transpose s. Yeah. So you kind of lose flexibility, but you also gain generalization. So if you, if you do well on one state and another state is very similar, then you kind of have a good sense of the value of the other state just because two states are similar. Whereas with an explicit array representation, there's no hope of generalization whatsoever. 
Uh, so on policy, off policy is not relevant for the for the um, uh, review. So we have we still have a few more topics. Maybe I can talk about on policy, off policy later. Right. So so after reinforcement learning, we moved on to unsupervised learning, where in unsupervised learning the we are given a set of examples x's, but there is no corresponding y, and our our task is to learn some interesting structure, right? and the structure we saw uh, in, in, in the class, basically we, we looked at two kinds of structures. The first one is, do the examples cluster in some way? Right? And k-means was the first algorithm that we saw. And in k-means, the idea is you're given you know, some set of some data set, you know, x1 through xd, right? And given this data set, um, that's all what you're given. There are no labels. You know, we don't have a y value that tells this, the, all these are class 1, class 2, class 3. That, you know, we don't have any of that, right? And our goal is to now kind of cluster them in some way, right? And th those were clustering algorithms. And there is this other kind of unsupervised learning uh, where we are interested in finding subspaces, x1 and xd. Right? If this is our uh, set of examples, x's, there is no y's given to us, right? Uh, in, 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 in clustering, we are trying to group examples into different categories, right? Whereas in subspace finding problems, we are trying to see if this high dimensional representation can be instead captured in a lower dimensional representation. So this data can be projected onto a one dimensional representation that pretty much captures all the variance, right? And this was in PCA. So we had these um, you know, uh, unsupervised learning, we had clustering prob problems and subspace finding problems. And in 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 uh, the two the two that uh, we spoke about just now, you know, k-means and PCA, we call them non-probabilistic. Okay? Non-probabilistic. Um, so k-means and PCA, okay? and we have probabilistic equivalents. For clustering, we use the Gaussian mixture model, okay? and for subspace finding, we use factor analysis. The the uh, rough intuition to have is think of clustering as the unsupervised version of classification, and subspace finding as the unsupervised version of regression. Right? That's 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 a loose loose uh, loose analogy there, right? And we use we also saw this algorithm called em or expectation maximization that we applied to solve the probabilistic versions you know, both gmm and factor analysis using this algorithm called expectation maximization right in expectation maximization which is really an important uh, algorithm especially if you want to get into machine learning research um, uh, you know in in you know some of the new hot topics like you know deep generative models it's very important that you have a good understanding of expectation maximization and all its variants um, because that's that's really where things kind of start off. Right? So in EM, we have parameters for a model. So we, we start with a model where here by model we mean some kind of a probabilistic model x comma z with some parameters theta, which has parameters theta and um, we call the observed components of uh, our model as evidence. So evidence is generally denoted as X, and we the other unobserved elements of the of the uh, 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 of the model are called latent variables. We call them Z, right? And in EM, 
what we do is this um, iterating, it, EM is an iterating algorithm where each iteration has two steps. The E step, we calculate the posterior, you know, Q of ZI is equal to P of ZI given XI at the current value of theta. And in the M step, right, we update the thetas to org max theta of expectation of z according to qi of log p of x z theta over qi of z right so here the org max theta the theta that we are optimizing appears only here right and and by by performing this this over and over um, this term is also called the elbow, right? By performing this over and over, we saw that this algorithm will eventually converge. We saw a proof of convergence of the EM algorithm, um, and and uh, this 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 algorithm will um, um, eventually converge, right? So that was that was uh, EM algorithm. The we also saw another another um, uh, model called ICA. Independent component analysis. We used it to um, we use it to solve the uh, source separation problem in audio. Right, you did that in your uh, last homework where you're given some some mixture of different signals. You make a non-Gaussian assumption about the sources of those signals, and using those non-Gaussian assumption, you're able to construct a unmixing matrix, and that unmixing matrix is calculated using maximum likelihood, right, and um, the, the unmixing matrix that you obtain will be able to separate your audio sources into distinct, um, um, distinct original um, audio components, right? So we saw this in the homework and in, in, again in your homework, in the EM algorithm, we saw an extension of this for semi-supervised learning, right? So it's, it's, uh, I would say it's pretty important to kind of understand that step, that leap from unsupervised to semi-supervised, how we went and Try to get a, a real sense of you know what the what the moving parts was in the proof for moving from 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 uh, unsupervised uh, to uh, semi-supervised. And what else? That's that's pretty much that we that uh, that we covered in this course. Then we also uh, um, in the, in the last few lectures we saw the variational autoencoder. Uh, again, in the variational autoencoder, we are um, the variation autoencoder is probably not not not, uh, uh, not going to be in your exam, but you know it's an important concept, especially those who want to uh, go into research, where you have the z, the latent variable, and x, the uh, evidence. In EM, we would construct a Q for each example, the posterior, whereas with the variation autoencoder, we construct an encoder network, neural network that takes x as input and outputs z as the output and given the latent variable to the evidence uh, in, in, in case of uh, for example simple models we call this the likelihood function right? but in, in the VAE we call this the decoder network. Right? And we train the um, um, so again, just like we saw in the in the in the fitted value iteration, right? In in the original EM, each example got its own Q function, right? For the for the posterior, and each Q of each example could be set independently and freely. Whereas with the variational autoencoder, we are trying to come up with this class. Now, just you know, have have a similar uh, a picture in your mind. You are trying to represent all the posteriors with some kind of a class, right? And which is called uh, amortized inference where instead of calculating a separate posterior for each, you construct this class where you feed x as the input and the output will be the parameters of the corresponding Q distribution. Right? Um, that's, that's, uh, and then in the last lecture, we covered evaluation metrics. Evaluation metrics are, are, are we've, uh, we don't have time to review them in, um, 
in today's lecture, but they are pretty, pretty straightforward. You can just look at the slides. So that completes uh, pretty much the, the uh, course review. Um, we've covered a lot of material in this course. Another few, few kind of uh, uh, ending remarks. So with all the kind of um, techniques that you've learned here, right, you can use these techniques for lots of different purposes, right? Your interest might be in research, your interest might be more applied. A general um, um, kind of um, um, ending note is to, you know, is to kind of uh, recognize the power that machine learning has. You can build really powerful algorithms using uh, machine learning, but hopefully, you know, also put some thought into the problems that you're trying to solve with these uh, algorithms. Um, Machine learning is a great tool. It gives you a lot of power, which means you know it can be used for good and it can be abused, right? Always put some thought into um, before you jump into a problem and try to uh, solve a problem using machine learning to think of what the possible side effects could be, right? So machine learning um, is at the end of the day, it is it 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 looks for correlation among examples. It has no sense of causality, right? And so the the problems that that are there with correlation, you know, as opposed to causation, transfer over to machine learning in, you know, um, with, this, with, the, with the same radars and, and, and restrictions. So um, any bias that is there in your data set will transfer over into your predictions. By bias, I, I don't mean bias and variance, but you know, any other kinds of bias uh, and, and, and fairness issues that may be there in, in, in the data set that you've collected, which may be, uh, which, uh, which may be you know, uh, not purely sampled, all those issues will transfer over to the predictions that you make, right? So always be skeptical about the way your data was collected, and especially if you're going to build some kind of a pipeline where actions are being taken depending on the predictions that you've made, you need to be especially even more skeptical about your model, right? At the same time, um, the you know uh, machine learning can be applied in lots of different fields. Uh, any field that collects data and needs predictions, you can use machine learning there, which means the scope of application of machine learning is tremendous. And probably uh, a, a, a good fraction of you might be interested in machine learning research, but probably uh, most of you are interested in applying machine learning to different, um, different areas. So the hope is that you know, the lessons that you've learned in this, in the, in this course, uh, especially the different set of tools that you learned as different models, and also the general principles like bias variance analysis will help you solve these problems in your respective fields. Right? And for those of you who are interested in machine learning research, right now machine learning research is super hot. There are lots of scope for, for doing um, you know, um, uh, cutting edge, bleeding edge uh, uh, research in machine learning. Um, so good luck for those of you who are who are um, um, interested in doing research. Happy to chat about research uh, offline. And to kind of uh, wrap things up, uh, I hope you enjoyed this course. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed the material uh, and uh, that we've kind of uh, covered. I personally enjoyed teaching this course a lot. I, I myself learned a lot in the, by you know by just going through the process of teaching. I pro you know the half of machine learning what. I know as of today, half of it probably I learned them in the last two months uh, in the process of uh, preparing for the lectures. Um, and good luck on your finals. Um, you know, the finals is, is designed to be hard. So, you know, uh, study, study hard. It, it's not long, but you know, it can be tricky. Uh, yeah, with that, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of uh, end the last lecture. Uh, thanks everyone.